Hello again, everyone. I have my second opportunity to share with you this year, so it's been a good start to the year for me. We're going we're gonna to start this morning with a little bit of a poll while the parents take their uh, children off to, to uh, the video in the den. And so here we go. I'd like you to stick your hand in there. How many of you are hoping that 2024 will be better than 2023? All right. Pretty solid majority. Good job there. All right. How, how many of you um, got to the end of 2023 and you're like, I am so glad that this year is done? Anyone there? Yeah? Right? 2023 was a tough year for some of us. Anyone have a lacquer 2023? Anyone was like, 2023 was fantastic. Right? Keep your hands in the air for me. Right? That's great to see. I want, keep, keep them up. I want, I want to ask you this. Put your hand down if you would like 2024 to be worse than 2023. Right? No one wants that. Right? None of us want that. Yeah, you can put your hands down now. This morning we're going to talk about hope and the consequences when that hope doesn't come through. That's why I've entitled my message, Preparing Our Hearts for Hardship. And you can stick that up for us now, Robs. If I had to give you a choice between the two options and say, guys, 2024 is going to be one of these two things. Either it's going to be a great year, it's going to be a year filled with fantastic memories, advancement, personal grain, great joy, or it's going to be a really hard year. You're going to struggle. You might lose someone that you love. You're going to feel stuck. You're going to struggle to get from one week to the next. I think we'd all pretty happily say I'd take option one, please. But none of us are voluntarily taking option two. Because there exists in us, and I think we all know this at a deep level, there's this primal drive for life. John Aldridge uses that term. There's this deep-seated desire to enjoy and appreciate the life that we have. It's a desire that is fundamentally good, and it's ultimately something I believe God has given to us. And so when life is good, we want to hold on to the goodness that we have. And when life is hard, there's a desire in us that longs for life to be good again. Does that, does that seem reasonable to you? Right? Do you look back at those times, those moments in your life when, when you, you, you kind of remember with that rose-tinted nostalgic fondness, you know, when life was, was good or simple. I don't know about you, but I catch myself doing this kind of often. I think back to, you know, a couple of years ago or a couple of decades ago when, Life was simple when all the people that I loved were still around. I think back over the years and, and some of the trauma and the challenge that we've been through, and I think, yes, it would be nice if some of those years that keep bringing trauma and challenge could just kind of stop, if there could be a little break, you know, a little siesta from the trauma and the challenge. Sometimes, and, and this, is, uh, this is my escapism that exists in my heart, sometimes I think, you know what would be great? I would love to go and live just in a small town somewhere. Somewhere that didn't have millions of people all over the place, where I wasn't exposed to the world's problems day in and day out. And there were just, you know, a small group of people that I had to know and deal with. Like that would be, see this, this desire that we have for life, for things to be good again. It's intrinsic to us. It's, it's deep-seated in our soul. But it's sometimes also deceptive. Because if you've lived life for any period of time, you will know that unfortunately it doesn't work like that. There was a chap in about 500 BC, his name was Heraclitus, he was a Greek philosopher, and he made this observation. He says, the only thing in life that remains constant is change. And we still have that expression today, two and a half thousand years later, because it has proved universally true for millennia. And I think Heraclitus was uh, plagiarizing a little bit from the wisdom of Solomon because Solomon said a very similar thing when he wrote Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And so we're going to read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, the first eight verses. And maybe ironically for you, maybe it's ironic for you as it is for me that this passage of Scripture is nostalgic for me because when I was in junior school, at the end of every term, we would have an assembly and they would read Ecclesiastes chapter 3 from verses 1 to 8. Even though I didn't appreciate it or understand it, I knew it quite well. So here's what Solomon has to say in Ecclesiastes 3. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. 
Time to tear down and a time to build. Time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to turn away. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. I want to make just four observations for us as by way of introduction from this passage this morning. And the first one is this. Change is inevitable. God has mandated that life will change. That is a fundamental part of life. And no matter how much we might wish it were otherwise, life will always change. There are seasons in life, rhythms that God has created and ordained, and they are as inescapable for us as spring and summer, autumn and winter. Change is inevitable. The second observation that flows from the first one is this. We don't get to control those changes. God is the one who has mandated that life will change. He is the one who sets the times and the seasons. And so whether or not we, the change we're experiencing is good or not, whether we like it or not, God is the one who controls the times and the seasons of our life. Sometimes we like to exercise as much control as we can. But human control is unfortunately, I want to say it's a delusion. It's, we think we can exercise more than influence over our lives. We think we can direct our paths and set our ways and determine what's going to happen. But that percentage of control is just a trap that is laid in our pride for us. And if you don't believe me, think back to a couple of years ago when the words of James really became so suddenly true. I, I remember reading the scripture in James chapter 4 from 13 to 14 often and thinking, oh, you know, like, it doesn't seem very real. Because James says, come now, those of you who say, today or tomorrow, we're going to go to this place or that city. We're going to spend a year there. We're going to carry on business. We're going to make a profit. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I'm, well, you know, James, honestly, most of the time, we, we kind of make plans. And, and it does work out like we made plans. And then in 2020, COVID happened. And people had planned to do something and were suddenly stuck and stranded and couldn't get from one city to the next Human control is a delusion. It's a, it's a trap that's laid in our pride because God sometimes graciously doesn't always intervene. So change is inevitable. We don't get to control the change. Here's a third observation. Some of the changes that you experience will be painful. Just have a look at some of the, the words that Solomon uses to describe the changes that will happen in our lives. And he starts and he says, right at the beginning, there will be a time to die. There will be a time today, right at the very beginning, we are reminded that nobody gets out of life alive. And while death actually holds no fear for us as Christians, which is a great blessing in the Lord, the manner of our passing will not be of our choice. No matter how well you live, no matter how fit you are, no matter how well you control what you eat and what you do, none of us gets to choose the manner in which we die. Solomon says there will also be a time to heal the thing about healing is that healing first requires a wound. And uh, as the recipient of my fair share of wounds, I can tell you wounds are generally not pleasant. They usually involve a degree of pain, and they can sometimes debilitate us for prolonged periods of time, for months or even years, depending on the nature of how you've been wounded. They can have a severe impact on our quality of life. Solomon says there's a time that we need to weep. He uses the Hebrew word here, bakor, which means literally to, to weep or to bewail. It's, that, it's not the gentle, silent leaking of tears as you're sad in the corner. It, it's the word we would use for like ugly crying. You know, when, when your emotions are just welling up within you and the tears are pouring and your heart is wrecked. Because Solomon says there is also a time to mourn. There will be seasons in our lives where we weep and we mourn the loss of what we have loved, whether it's people, relationships, items of value, hopes and dreams. I remember as I was doing some research for, for what I was going to share this morning, and as I was reading about how to cope with change and reading a couple of articles on that, one of the first suggestions on how to cope with change was make sure you have a great group of people around you. 
And I thought, well, that's really great, except when the change that you're experiencing is the loss of those great people. You know, that makes that step a little bit harder. There's a space where we mourn the people that we love who have been our strengths and supports. Solomon says, it's going to be a time to turn away, which you contrast with the time to embrace. And, and at one level, this may be an expression of love between two people, but I think more broadly, it describes the beginning and the ending of friendships. There are times when friendships end, when intimacy changes, where relationships that were once close become distant. So it says there's going to be a time to hate. And to hate something, you must be in the presence of something that is worthy of your hate. And things that are worthy of our hate are unpleasant things to be around. Solomon also says there is a time for war. And in the Old Testament, war is a bit more common in the life of the Israelites than it is maybe for us today in South Africa. But we exist in a spiritual war all the time. Some of you may have been involved in wars in and around Africa as you were conscripted and, and sent to be in different places around the country and the continents. I remember a friend of mine whose dad used to have a panga that hung up in his garage. And we were never allowed to ask about the panga. War is a terrible thing. It's something we wish we could all avoid, but the choice is often not ours to make. Whether that is physical war that we get sent to, or it's a spiritual war that all of us experience every day of our lives. All of this is to say in this observation that sometimes God will bring change into your life and that change will be painful. And you probably won't like it, but it won't be avoidable. Fourth observation from Ecclesiastes. If God has ordained these seasons in our lives, He has a purpose for them. And I've left this one to last because this observation is most helpful in foresight or in hindsight. It's often unhelpful in the midst of, of trial and hardship. And so if for you right now this space is really horrible, you can tune me out for the next 30 seconds or so. But just stash this one away for later. But if you are, in, uh, for the rest of us as a reflection, when you think back over the trials that you have been through, or as you look forward and you're in a good space right now, remember that if God leads you into a season of challenge and trial, God is doing something in you in that season. Something you may not know, something you may not be able to comprehend or understand, but God knows, and He is the one who is doing it. James reminds us from James 1 this time, he says, brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for joy. Change your perspective. Think about what God is doing, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. And when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So four observations. Change is inevitable. We can't control that change. Sometimes that change is painful. And if God has ordained it, He is doing something in it. The problem, though, with change is that when God brings change into our life and that change is challenging. Our hearts tend not to accept that change, but we want to rebel against what God is doing. And perhaps the most poignant example of this can be found in the story of the people of Israel as they come out of Egypt. I'm going to read for you just two passages that describe them saying to Moses and to God, Let, we want to go back. We, we, don't, we want to reverse this change that has happened in our life. Exodus chapter 16, from 1 to 3. It says, the whole community of Israel, they set out from a place called Elam. They journeyed to another place called the Wilderness of Sin between Elam and Mount Sinai. And they arrived there on the 15th day of the second month, one month after leaving the land of Egypt. And there too, the whole community of Israel, they complained about Moses and Aaron. And they said, if only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. There we sat around pots that were full of meat and we ate all the bread that we wanted. But you've brought us into this wilderness to starve to death. This happens a month after they've left Egypt. Even worse, it happens just after God has separated the Red Sea. They've walked through to escape the Egyptian threat. God has then collapsed the sea over the Egyptians, destroying those who are seeking to take their life. But they're not happy. 
Let's carry on a little bit. You're going to Numbers chapter 14. Now you find the Israelites, they're on the edge of the promised land. They're about to step into the inheritance that God has for them. God has led them through the desert. He's given them food. He's given them water. He's made their clothing indestructible. And I would just like to say, Lord, if you want to make my clothing indestructible, that would be great. I'm not a big clothes shopper. And they're, as they're on the boundary to the new home, the spies have come back. And they've just reported, and they said, guys, look, the thing you need to know about this land that God has prepared for us is the people there, they're pretty big. They're, the cities are also pretty big. It's, I'm not convinced it's going to be such a great time if we try to go into the land. And so having heard that report, it says this, the whole community began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. And their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. They said, if only we had died in Egypt or even in the wilderness, they complained. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle, to have our wives and our little ones carried away as plunder? Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? And so catch this, they plotted among themselves, let us choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. So just for good measure, I want to remind you of what they wanted to go back to. Exodus chapter 1 says, So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, and they hoped to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and to make bricks and to do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. And then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Sephra and Pura. When you help the Hebrew woman give birth, watch as they deliver. And if the baby is a boy, kill him. If he's a girl, let it live. What do you have to be thinking to want to go back to that? Not only are you going back to be a slave where you have no rights, but you're going back to a place of clear and abject abuse where your children have been systematically murdered by the government that you are governed by. And you're not just going back as a neutral people. You're going back to a ruler whose army was destroyed because it pursued you. You're going back to a people whose land has been desecrated by ten plagues because of you. You're going back to a ruler whose firstborn son is dead because of you. How do you think that's going to go? What's going to happen when they get back? Hey, sorry about all that stuff. Can we come back? What is going on in the hearts of the people of Israel for them to want to make such a bad decision? I want to give you, I want to offer three three ideas. And the first two come from the text. And if you read on in Numbers 14, you'll see this is a big part of the problem. They didn't believe God. They didn't believe God. God had said, guys, I will lead you into the land. I will clear out the inhabitants. But they didn't believe him. They had heard the report of the spies. They had seen the size of the obstacles that were in front of them. And those obstacles had loomed larger in their eyes than the promises of God. And so they didn't believe that God would do what he said he would do. Secondly, they were afraid. They were afraid as they looked at the size of the obstacles and as they did not believe God, they began to worry that the people they loved would die, that they would lose loved ones. And that future scared them and their fear overwhelmed them. And then they missed, I think, and this is is Brad's option, so take it lightly. I think they may have misremembered what their time in Egypt was like. And The Scripture doesn't say this, but we do this as humans. I did read some interesting research about how this happens in the human brain, which we can chat about afterwards if you want. But I don't know if you've ever looked back on your past, remembered times or seasons in your life, and in your memories, you tend to focus more on the good than the bad. So for instance, maybe as an adult, you look back on your time in high school, and you remember it with that nostalgic fondness, and you think, man, it was great when life was so simple, and I just had to worry about getting my homework done for the next day, and I could spend the whole weekend playing cricket in the back garden and watching test cricket. That was what I did, and it was fantastic. But you forget those moments of crushing loneliness when you asked a girl out, and she said no, and you felt like no one would ever love you, or you waited in vain for a boy to ask you out, and it just never happened. 
Or that moment where something happened in front of your friends and you were mocked and ridiculed and made to feel stupid in front of the class or the school. Or the moment you got home from your day at school and your parents sat you aside and told you that unfortunately they were getting a divorce and the veneer of your perfect family was ripped away. I think in all of these reflections from the Israelites, they're so descriptive of us. How often in the face of hardship and challenge and trial do we fail to believe that God will do what he said he will do? How often are we afraid of what might happen, of the unknown and of change, and so we shy back from it instead of embracing it? How often do we honeycoat our past, forgetting that every season carries a mix of both blessings and hardship? So when we encounter change that God brings into our lives, and that change is challenging, our hearts can rebel against that change. And it's because of this difficulty and this, this hardship in our heart that we need to prepare ourselves for trial and for challenge. Because there is a, that good and intrinsic desire for things to be good again or for the good things to remain forever. It's just deceptive. Life doesn't work like that. And so as we look at 2024, I can promise you that there will be times that are hard. I don't want to tell you that, but that is the reality of life. How do we prepare our hearts for that hardship? I'll give you three short pieces of advice as I wrap up. The first is this. We need to expect change, and we need to expect hardship. Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And when our hope is that everything good will stay or that the present difficulty that we're in will pass quickly, we can set ourselves up for a greater degree of heartache because we're hoping for something that God hasn't yet ordained to happen. I love how Jesus modeled this with his disciples. You know that three times during Jesus' ministry with his disciples, he pulls them aside and he says, guys, listen, I've got some bad news that I need to share with you. There is going to come a time where this space that we have together is going to end. And we're not going to be able to hang out like we do at the moment. In fact, I'm going to be arrested, taken away, and killed. And each time he shares that with them, they go, no, Jesus, that'll never happen. To the point where one time he does it, Jesus actually has to stand up and say to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. So Jesus prepares his disciples and then we get to John chapter 16. And in John chapter 16, the disciples are sitting down with Jesus at the Last Supper, and they're having this long conversation. And Jesus takes the whole chapter to speak into their hearts because he knows that the season that is about to be inaugurated is going to be hard for them. And he knows there is fear that they are carrying, and they are worried about what that's going to mean. And so he begins to, to try and comfort them in the midst of that. And at the end of John chapter 16... The last verse, Jesus says this. He says, I've told you all of these things, right? What the preceding chapter. Because here on earth, no, sorry. I've told you all of these things so that you may have peace in me. I want you to know these things. I want you to be prepared because there is a peace that is, exists for you. Here on earth, you will have many trials and many sorrows, but I want you to take heart because I have overcome this world. He's just told them, he's told them again, fourth time. Guys, I'm going to be arrested and I'm going to die. And when that happens, you are going to be persecuted because you believe in me. And in case you, you've, they kind of missed all of that, he sums it up and he says, in this world you will have many trials and sorrows. Not some, not one or two, many. In this world, in this life, you will have many trials and sorrows. But I have also told you all of this so that you may have peace in me and so that you may take heart because I have overcome the world. Friends, knowing that life will have its share of trials and sorrows helps us to be prepared for them. And in addition to that, there is a peace that is available to us in Christ, a peace that Paul says surpasses understanding, that transcends whatever circumstance or situation you might find yourself in. And armed with the right expectation and the peace of God, we can access through prayer. Jesus says to us, take courage, take heart, be strengthened, stand up, because I have overcome the world. Second piece of advice to prepare ourselves for hardship, choose to hold on to seasons lightly. 
choose to hold onto seasons lightly. God has appointed a time and a duration for every season of our lives, whether blessed or tumultuous. Each season has a fixed duration that God has determined, and it will pass in the fullness of time. And what matters above all else is that which remains for eternity. So Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthian church, he writes to them and he encourages them to to strive after those things that matter. And I've included verses 8 and 9 because I want you to see the degree to which Paul is struggling with the season he is in. He says, guys, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed. We don't know what's going on, but we are not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but we are never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. And that is why we never give up. For though our bodies are dying, though we are suffering, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles, don't you love this, are small and they won't last very long. Sometimes a very hard thing to say when you're in the midst of that trouble and it's big and it's real and it's consuming your life. But Paul says in light of eternity, that season will actually be short. But they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. That's God's promise. So don't look at the troubles that you can see. Rather, fix your gaze on the things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things that we cannot see will last forever. By enduring these trials... There is an eternal consequence that vastly outweighs them. That's our promise in God. An eternal reward that will put them to shame. And in light of that prize, we will, all, we will receive that for our faithful service. Paul says, fix your eyes on the goal. Fix your heart on the things that matter. Strive after the things that are eternal. For the seasons in this life are ultimately short and they will soon be gone. So strive for that which lasts. And so if you are enduring a season at the moment of deep trial and challenge, the encouragement for you is to know that it will not last forever. There will come a time when God draws it to an end. And the challenge to you is if you are enduring a season of great blessing, don't hold too tightly to it. Because there will also come a time where God will draw that to an end. Instead, let us fix our eyes on the prize and strive for that which has eternal meaning and significance, what God has called us to. In Christ Jesus. Last piece of advice, and then we're done. Choose to live in the present. Not for the present, but live in the present. We sang this song earlier this morning. I'm so glad that we did, Shills. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. That song comes from Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Choose to rejoice in the day that God has made. This day, today, you don't get to live this day over again. It only exists once in this moment. Rejoice, be glad in it. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes, he says, Guys, I want you to make the most of every opportunity because the world around us is evil. So don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Understand that today is a day that God has given to you. And there are things that He is going to do that are unique to today. That you can rejoice and be glad in. And and look and say, God, what are you putting before me today to step into? Every day is a gift. Let's not waste the days that God has given to us dreaming about what once was or longing for some future reality that we hope will be. Choose to be present in the moment. Choose to rejoice in each new day that God gives you and make the most of them. We have the incredible grace to live each day closely connected with our Lord and our Savior. He's always present, and He is always working. Jesus said, my Father is always at work. And so He shows me what to do. Look to Him. God, what have you put before me today that I can step into for your kingdom that is eternal? I'm going to close in prayer this morning. And um, I'd like to ask you all just to, to close your eyes as we do that. And I'm going to pray for all of us generally. But I recognize there may be some of you who are sitting here this morning and you wanted 2023 to end because the season you were in is just really tough. 
at the moment. And if you are in the midst of a season of deep trial and heartache, I want to encourage you, why don't you just lift a hand, and we'd love to pray for you, specifically in the midst of this. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, I thank you that you are Emmanuel, the God who is with us. Your promise to us as your disciples, Jesus, that you will be with us always, even to the very end of the age. You spoke through David and you said, even as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil because you are with me. You are with me. The good shepherd is with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Even in the worst and most challenging of spaces, God, you are there. My cup overflows. So, Lord, I want to pray this morning, first of all, for those of us who are here this morning, and life is hard at the moment. This season is a season of heartache and pain and challenge. And, Lord, I want to pray for a grace to take courage to receive the strength that comes from being with the presence of our King. And to recognize that in the midst of this deep challenge, you are working. That you, your love is present, your grace is present. And you sustain us in the midst of trial. So Lord, strengthen your sons and your daughters this morning who are carrying that burden. And encourage them, God, to live for this moment, in this moment, knowing that this too will pass. And God, I pray for all of us as we go into the year that is ahead of us. I pray, God, that you would guard us from getting lost in what could be and what was. That you will help us to recognize that each day comes as a gift from you and each season is mixed. We'll have both blessing and trial. Strengthen us, God, as we endure that which is hard. And help us, God, in the midst of those challenges to set our eyes on Jesus and to live for the things that carry eternal value. For we know that these light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. And Lord, as we enjoy the blessing of your grace and your abundance in our life, help us not to hold on to those things so tightly that we're unable to step into the season that follows them. Lord, we want to be a people that are prepared to follow you into whatever comes next, knowing that you will do what you have said you will do, and that you are a good and faithful God. Lord, we commit ourselves into your hands together this morning, and we trust, Lord, that as we follow you into 2024, we will see the kingdom of God come in increasing measure in our lives and the lives of those that we encounter. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.